Congo, formerly known as Zaire, and he does a lot of work in terms of the international community in Haiti, et cetera. Brother uh, Paul Humphrey Uhuru. Uhuru. When talking about the Congo, you're talking about one, the second largest country and area in the continent of Africa. It's the country that has the second largest rainforest in the world. It's the country that has the second largest river, most powerful river in the world. And it's by far probably the richest country in the world. Now, what do I mean by that? The Congo has about $22 trillion worth of minerals. And that's in its raw form. If those minerals were refined, you were probably looking at about two or three hundred trillion dollars worth of minerals. The Congo, with its rainforest, I mean, with its rainfall, as well as its fertile land, that one country could produce enough food to feed nine billion people a year. There's only seven billion people on this earth. Mm. The Congolese River is so powerful that if it was hydroelectric dams put on that one river, you could produce enough electricity to address the needs of electricity of the continent of Africa for the next 30 years. Now the question should be asked is why is this not a reality today? And the answer is, that you have imperialist powers led by the United States that decided that that wealth belongs to them. And it has come at a heavy cost to the people of the Congo. Because after all, how could a mining company come in and ask, could they mine a particular area in the eastern part of the Congo if there's a village living on that piece of land? So what is the United States answer to that? Look for client states like Uganda and Rwanda. Supply them with weapons and use satellite logistics to have them go in and slaughter the people living on the land. And then have the mining companies go to the government, a government that was not elected by the people of the country, and say, well, no one's living here. Can we mine here? And that's what's going on today. The United Nations sent out a report in 2006 that stated that from 1996 to 2006, the Uganda and Rwandan army killed an estimated 6 million people just in that eastern part of the Congo where those minerals are located. Okay. And that was done with U.S. tax dollars. That's right. mm. <laughs> tax dollars that they tell you they don't have to fix up our schools yeah. in the urban centers of this country. Tax dollars that they say they don't have money for affordable housing in our communities. Tax dollars that they say that they do not have. So this situation in the Congo, where it may seem afar, has a direct impact on what's going on in our communities today. Because they're taking much needed resources to address the needs of our community here, just to help some greedy corporation yeah. rob the people of the Congo. And so this is something that we should keep in mind when we start talking about electoral politics. Because we have both Democrats and Republicans aligning themselves with the corporations, such as Apple, mm. where they go after the Cotan, and Tesla, mm. who goes after the Cobalt. And not only that, they use children at the age of five years old, using their hands to dig out the cobalt out of the ground. 
Radioactive. Radioactive and poisonous. Because they don't care about the people. Now, let's understand when the United States recognized that Cotan could change the electronic industry because Cotan is the reason why today you have laptops versus these tower computers with the fan in them because Cotan allows electronic components to function without overheating. It allows for flat screen TV screens to take place because they don't need the big box to allow the heat that you leave from the electronic components. When they realized that that was a reality and that 64% of the Cotan in the world happened to be in the Congo, in the eastern part of the Congo, and there was a, a good size amount of it in Australia, but these industries didn't want to pay Australia the price that Australia would have demanded to buy their Cotan. So they said, why not just steal it from the Congo? We've been stealing everything else from the Congo. But then they realized also that the dictator they had put in power for 32 years, Mobutu, was too greedy. If he had any idea how much this mineral was actually worth, they wouldn't get it at the dirt cheap price they have that they wanted it for. So what did they do? They sent an envoy to the Congo and told Mobutu to leave. Mm -hmm. Of course, Mobutu got insulted and said, how dare you tell me to leave my country? And he didn't say it by the way most people would say my country, meaning that you're from that country. He meant he owned the country. And that's why he didn't want to leave. And so the United States realized they had to use military force to cause that to happen. And they went to Uganda, and of course, Museveni, the president of Uganda, got in power through a military coup with the help of the United States and Great Britain. And they said, yes, sir, boss. Hmm. And then they went to Rwanda and Burundi and Kenya, and they said, we're not interested. So what did the United States do? This is under George Herbert Walker Bush. They decided to take a gentleman who happened to be the head of intelligence in the Ugandan army by the name of Paul Kagame. Mm -hmm. Yes, that same Paul Kagame who's now president of Rwanda today. His family left Rwanda in 1953. And from 53 to 94, he lived in Uganda. And they brought him over to Port Leavenworth, brought him into the CIA and said, look, we want you to now organize the Rwandans living in Uganda like yourself to start going across the border and attacking government installations. We want you to go out to the police station, schools, anything having to do with the government. This was George Herbert Walker Bush tactic. But of course, George Herbert Walker Bush lost the election in 92, and in 1993, you had a different president, the one called Hillbilly Clinton. And he decided to do a different tactic. And his tactic was to go to the different countries involved, Rwanda, Burundi, Kenya, and say, look, let's, let's set up a peace negotiation between these so-called rebels coming from Uganda. And let's see if we can no negotiate a peace over here in Tanzania. Well, Kenya said, I'm not interested. Mobutu said he wasn't interested, but the president of Rwanda and the president of Burundi said, okay, let's try this. And the U.S. sent them a plane. They fly over to Tanzania. They have negotiations with the so-called rebel group out of Uganda. They come up with an agreement. And when the plane is flown back to Rwanda with the two presidents in it, it was shot out of the air. More than likely with a U.S. missile. And that's the start of the war in 1994 in Rwanda that we know as the Rwandan War. Of course, the news media doesn't spend much time talking about that. No, that's right. And the question we should be asking here in the United States is what is the cost of the military 
budget. Why is it that the United States can find $100 billion to send, quote unquote, to Ukraine, when in reality, that money is not going to Ukraine? That money is going to Lockheed Martin, you know, and other military contractors. Okay? It's not going to Ukraine. At the same time, they say they don't have money for affordable housing. They don't have money for our cities that are falling apart and our public schools that are falling apart. Tuition for colleges, even in public schools, have gone through the roof. And they don't have money to offset the loans that sometimes people have to pay as many as 30 years to pay off their college loans. This is where we are today in this country, given to us by the politicians of this country. So elections are important, and we need to keep in mind why they are important. Because you're not going to hear CNN or MSNBC or Fox News talking about these points. But these are the real deal is why, in fact, our uh, out-of-control military expenditures, which has now gotten up to a trillion dollars a year, is causing a tremendous amount of hardship in this country, in our communities, because the country says, oh, well, we, we, can't, uh, we can't deal with the rec center for our youth. We can't uh, keep the prices of our universities and our public universities low so they can be affordable. Even though you have countries like India where a lot of the universities are basically free. But the big difference is they're not spending the kind of military money where their tax dollars are going. That's right. And yet we still got these politicians saying they're looking out for us hmm. when they're voting for these military dollars, our tax dollars to go to these military industries to carry out these unjust wars around the world that we live in. So I say, we ask for you all to, for those who are interested, and I believe all of us are, in ending this atrocity happening in the Congo, to go to freecongo.org we have a letter that we would like for you to send to your local congressman, your local U.S. senator, telling them to end the funding for the military of Rwanda. And people sit back and they say, well, Rwanda is an economic miracle. On whose blood and on whose minerals is Rwanda this economic mineral? Why does Rwanda have a coltan refinery plant when they virtually have no coltan? Where's the coltan coming from? Yeah. These are the kind of questions that uh, you won't find Rachel Maddow asking on her show. And so as we push for a world that is just, as we push for our government addressing the real needs in our communities. And that's not putting up more tents, but decent housing, affordable health care, or free health care for that matter. Yeah. Free. You know, that's only going to happen if we have politicians willing to say no to the U.S. and military industrial complex, something similar to what um, President Eisenhower said in his final speech leaving the White House to be aware of the military industrial complex. Because clearly, there's not a war the United States uh, military industrial complex doesn't want to go to because it puts more money in their pocket and takes more money from ours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brother Paul. And also, what is the name of the of the uh, film again that people can watch for free that you all produced? 
I will get Brother Paul to answer that question. I do know that on friend, that a friend of the Congo, they have produced a, a documentary that people can watch. And um, I will get I will get that information from Brother Paul and make sure that everybody gets it. I will get that information. I will answer your question. Oh, sure. Thank you. Yes, we have a video on YouTube that's called Justice in the Congo. It's also on our website, which is friendsofthecongo.org. Um, that tells you the story about what's happening in the war inside the Congo. And in that video, we even interviewed members of the U.S. State Department that were um, located in Rwanda leading up to the time of the war. And they said they didn't understand why after the war was over in Rwanda, the United States was shipping all these arms. Uh, this, you got to remember, was when Bill Clinton, the Democrat, was president to Rwanda because the real purpose of the killing of the president of Rwanda in the first place was to get Rwanda to go and push Mobutu out of power inside the Congo. And I'm gonna bring up one other point. In 1995, I helped organize a delegation of people to go to Haiti. And this is right after they had returned President Aristide, who had been taken out of power by a military coup in 1991. And the U.S. ambassador um, in, in the, uh, Haiti at the time, his name was William Swing. Because U.S. troops and French troops kept stopping our vehicles from moving around in Port-au-Prince, the delegation began to insist that we meet with the U.S. ambassador. So we set the meeting up. And I was determined I didn't want to ask this guy any questions. I just wanted to get out of the building. But as I'm listening to him answer questions, I realized this guy was CIA. And so I asked him a question. And the question was, what is his history in the State Department? And I encourage you to go and Google his name. His name was William Swing. This guy told me that he was in Congo Brazzaville. He gave me the year. I said, there was a military coup in Congo Brazzaville. Then he said he went to Liberia. And guess what? The year he gave, he was in Liberia, there was a military coup. Then he left from Liberia, he went to South Africa right before Nelson Mandela was let out of jail to make sure that Mandela would never be in an effective position as president of South Africa. And then from there, he left and went to Nigeria when Abacha had a military coup. And from Nigeria, he went to Haiti after Eric C was going to be brought back from a military coup. 